is uh, Anushka Kumar Singh. Good morning, all. Okay, uh, so. It's real happy to see you all here meeting each year like as a bunch of coaches, professionals, which is really help to improve the culture of safety across the industries as well as this knowledge that we gather here will definitely enhance the new structures that we want to build within the industries in the name of safety. So this definitely will help to improve and transform the industries and professionalism to the next level. Let me try to explain our eight decades of safety journey three decades of structured, rigorous implementation which help us to transform the behavior and to become excel in safety. As you see, it's our focus here is on people. That's how we build the vision zero. This Vision Zero is focused on our journey for zero fatalities, zero injuries, zero motor vehicle accidents, zero net emissions to the environment and zero tolerance of unsafe behavior and practices. You can see how much importance we have given to people in building this culture as well as parallel, we are not going to tolerate any unsafe behavior and any unsafe practice within our systems. How we come here? I'm not going to explain each and every element of this picture. You professionals in the same as I here, you understand how important this leadership, commitment, understanding the physical environment and understanding the social context and also understanding the inherent risk in what we do, what we all do in our organizations. Taking care of all these activities, taking care of all these contexts, taking care of all these scenarios, we ensure we build an organizational culture which our topic of the day, safety keeps in the middle of all of these things. Here, you all know what is safety, culture curve piece. And we proudly, we are proudly to say, we have been able to enter into or step into interdependent safety culture. Where each and every one of us who works for Universe care about other people's safety, colleagues' safety. It's not an easy journey. It's not an easy, it's it, it definitely not a cakewalk. I believe all you guys in your industries, in your factories, in your office environments, you understand how difficult we take efforts to make it. What we talk about the organizational structure we built 
previously in previous slide was held. It was not one day journey as I told you. It was a journey of eight decades came in, we were brought into here, we are, we are now. As always, we keep, we keep strengthening, we keep strengthening our framework standards on safety. And we continuously, but still, continuously focusing on the behavioral excellence. What we call is BSAFE, Behavioral Safety Excellence in Unilever. Which, 15 years back, we identified this behavioral excellence is an integral, important part which should be, be the key pillar in your safety journey. We, uh, with some external expertise, world external expertise in safety, biggest organizations in safety excellence, we create a program called Be Safe, which we focusly driven each and every person in the organization to become a person who cares about others. That's how we come here. The journey starts from the top. As always, we talk about the leadership commitment. When we start the behavioral safety excellence program 15 years back, the first ones to be trained on Be Safe was Group CEO and Group Executive Committee. First, from the top, we need to understand. And from there, we came all across countries, all across the regions, and into all our factories and all our officers. And now we are training actually the third party contracting employees on behavioral safety. Outsource operator, operating persons. For example, a security persons who are working for Unilever, which is not a part of Unilever organization, who are not part of uh, Unilever codes, but still they are working with us hand on hand in making our journey success. So we decided to come to a level, we need to train all these people, lorry drivers. I know my advantage colleagues who are here might know how we drive this. Lorry drivers works totally outside our operation, but still they do work for us. They transport our goods, so they need to be aware of our safety systems and protocols. Again, I will tell you, Junili, a behavioral safety excellence program, what we made is focusing 15 years back, which we now, few years back, only very few years back, we were able to step into the interdependent safety level of safety culture, which still we believe our tail is still in independent level and some edge of the tail might go to the dependent culture as well. That's how it is. It's not that easy to bring it to this level. How we deal with this culture? It's with confidence. It's with competence. It's with care. That's how we build this culture. All together, we were able to sustain this culture through these efforts continuously, every day, every morning, every night. We were talking about safety. We always believe there's nothing called over-communication. Hence, we always do communicate. We always do talk to people. I will tell you a small example, which I personally experienced uh, two, three years back, which is a very proud moment as a head of safety for this organization, which I can be really stand here and tell, hey guys, I'm the head of safety 
for unity in Sri Lanka. How proud I can be. That pride doesn't come just because of myself. It came through all the journey, all the people who did a lot of work to build this. Over the decades. I, let me come to this example. Uh, two, three years back, uh, there was an international conference on the workshop we had for Unilever people uh, in Sri Lanka, where there was a, there was a uh, boat ride, or like there was a, some uh, entertaining and engagement sessions outside the, the work was planned. And uh, since it's a high profile team, and I was also there just to ensure everything is perfect. Uh, when there's that, it's a small group of like 20 people. Uh, just before this boat ride start, I just overheard. It's not good to listen to other speakers, other people's uh, what they talk, but still, I just, I was still there. Uh, one person from the, there, there was another lady. They asked, uh, she, uh, she asked from the other lady, are you scared to go in the boat ride? The answer delighted me. She told me, no. I trust in Unilever safety. If Unilever safety has cleared this activity, I don't have any fear of doing anything they recommended. That's the level of confidence we have built into the people. They come to different country unknown. Unknown people, unknown territories, unknown waters. Still they believe Unilever safety will take care of them. And after all, it's little bit might be easy to come, comparatively easy to come to a level to this independent safety culture. But to maintain it there, we call it the 10 axle model of safety culture. You can see I'm not going to talk about each and every element. You guys are very well aware of what I mean in each and every word here. What we do here is we keep this within the system. We ensure that it does not go out of the way or out of the control by putting these 10 axles around it. Everything, management commitment to teamwork to learnings to communications to reporting systems. We'll talk about reporting system a little later in little uh, sites. So this ensure that we will keep it within our control and it will not go beyond. See, we all know how much we do. Anything could happen. Anything could go wrong at any time. That's how it is. So then how we manage? We, do we take care of each and element, each and every element of uh, organization, culture to maintain this? That's not the question now. Is there a better way to do this? One such part is governance. One such part is governance. Where we always talk about the leadership. I'll tell small one example how we drive this in our organization. Leadership has to practice, leadership has to lead. They may need to become role model as well as it has it need to become their part of their job. We have assigned national safety subcommittees, we call it, on different aspects. To each and every board member in University of Lanka. So they are not experts of safety at all. There are finance experts, there are supply chain experts, there are marketing experts in the board, but they do lead one pillar, one element of safety at the national level. 
and it's key part of their job. It's no one is going to say I'm a marketing director. This is not that important for me. No, they drive it with passion. That's the culture they have been brought in until the directors. When they become directors, they know how important. That's how the culture helps to make it happen. Our sales director, for example, leads road safety for us. Our marketing director leads event safety for us. Our finance director leads office safety for us in the organization. So they do, they do it as a part of their job. And also we have executive committee, central safety, health, environment, executive committee, which we call in short form CSHEC. CSHEC is a body, the apex body of safety of each unity organization across the world which comprise board of directors and country head of health and safety. Only these few people. They are the people who need to drive. So you can understand where health and safety kept at organization. Board of directors and country head of health and safety are two together to govern these things. And also, it's a mandatory agenda point in the board meeting. There's not, no board meeting happens without safety presentation, safety activity or safety uh, point to be discussed there. Also, we go into the next levels, unit health, safety and environment activities, which are all factories, all functions. It's from logistics to manufacturing to marketing, planning, and we, are, we have all functions, we have units. These u shapes take decision with the leadership of that u shape to what? What is under their control? Obviously, there are procedures and protocols coming from to guide them. Yes, but they take the ownership. That's how it is. And also, we go into the next level to the shop floor. Each and every workflow member. Is a member of one safety committee in the factory or the particular function. So they do gather, they do discuss, they do tell us what's their concerns. So it's always two-way communications. It's come from shop floor to U shape to C shapes as well as it's go from top to bottom. So in the both ways we are keeping this governance mechanism and communication mechanism together. Let's come to small things, brilliant basics. Nothing to talk, but we do these basics without fail. That we need to ensure. Everyone needs to be ensured. All these basics Practice every day, every moment. Permit to work, a simple permit to work mechanism can help you a lot. In a, in a sim, single factory of us, there are probably 70 to 80 permit to work issued in a day. So without a permit to work, you can't do anything at all. That's how it is. And also, we make it not a separate thing in Unilever. In Unilever management system, there are 10 pillars, which is one is safety. So you know, if one pillar collapse, entire building collapse. So we ensure safety is part and parcel of each, everyone's work every day. That's how we govern it. So safety is not something to be do separately than our job. Safety is part of our job. And also, we ensure management of change happens in very smooth way 
as well as in very precise manner no one can escape or no, no simple thing can escape from the process. It's a digitized standard approach. Model is digitized just to keep everything simple and easy for access for everyone and people are defined. A particular activity goes, there are a set of people who need to be involved. Without going into that people, the process not flow into that, the next level. So which then will not uh, take out your money from the budget. You can't just pull, it, pull out your, you just uh, create the purchase order for the next activity. As well as throughout the journey, finally, when, in, when it is, comes to close, the final payment goes after ensuring pre-commissioning safety assessment and post, uh, we call it CSSR, uh, pre-startup safety review. All these two has to be done and sign off by respective people who started the work, who authorized the work. They need to ensure everything comes in the form way we want and be decided and then they need to go back to the flow, to the machine which we install, commission, then ensure then it has all the things, 100%, 1, 2, 3, 4, 100% it should be. Then they sign off for the management. By this way, we, we, we make people accountable for whatever they do. No one can later and think, I thought he will do, I thought that person might uh, have done it. There's no such thing like that. Everyone sign off. Yes, I check, it's okay to go in. I check, it's okay to go in. In each, everyone's technical perspective, engineering, safety, quality, etc. And we always believe small actions make a big difference. There's a terminology for this SABD, we call it in believers. We have a separate fund for the project, the fund for SABD projects as well. Small actions make a big difference. All you know. I don't want to talk about anything, the compliance, the Nihani's reporting, hazard identification, you all know this. I'll let me a little bit elaborate something on safety post. What is safety post for us? You know, post is stop for a while, right? We hold for a while. It is mandatory. We make it mandatory a few years back. Now it has become, now it's becoming a practice. Each and every meeting, including board meetings, need to be started with the safety post. No meeting should start without talking about safety. It's a small thing. You can talk about a small incident. It's a very generic one. It's, we are not going into the details of process safety. We are not going into details of uh, uh, physics or process uh, engineering to discuss these things. Everyone, we say layman's, not technical professionals, get meeting, a marketing meeting. Marketing meeting start with the safety post. One will talk about what they experienced yesterday. One may talk about uh, what they saw yesterday. Small thing. I went there, here I saw this kind of things, which we uh, communicate, which we discuss. Okay this could have happened. In my home, my little kid slipped through this. If it could be this. So then let's discuss. So it, it's enlightening others. That's the important thing. I suggest you, as at least one takeaway from my 20 minutes of this speech, take a safety post at all of your organizations. Small thing, every small thing to do, but it has a real good impact. It ensures everyone talks about safety every day, every moment. See, a person goes for five meetings. See, we are a <laughs> company with too much meetings, I believe, sometimes, but still, if someone goes five, six meetings, 
all these five, six meetings, he talks about safety rules. He heard five, six times on safety. HR meeting, finance meeting, marketing meeting, still we talk about it, safety rules. <coughs> after all, things can go wrong. After all, after we do all these things, things can go wrong. If things can go wrong, then we should have a process to ensure that after all we learn everything from there. So we take this opportunity. Yeah, something unfortunate happened. But from there, how can we learn from something? Learn. And also, we keep, before learning, we need to know such thing happens. That's the, we have a standard, separate standard. S220. Unilever stand, standard on safety in serious SHG occurrences, reporting and monitoring. So, according to this standard, we, we do report, we do notifications. What is the five times we have given? Within four hours, you need to inform to your next level. It could be SMS, it could be a WhatsApp message, it could be a phone call, but you need to tell something has happened. Then, within 24 hours, <coughs> initial notification on this particular incident should go to Junilieva executives who are sitting in London and who governs the entire business across the globe. They should be notified within 24 hours. It, within 24 hours, if it is a complicated incident, we don't have. It's an initial notification. It's talk about what has happened, what is the basic classification might be, if we know who has impacted, small, small information. So then, UAE or our executive board who runs the business across the globe knows this is something has happened in that particular country and that country. After all, we gave maximum of 30 days. Seven days is ideal, we say, but maximum of 30 days. We say, you have to have a very detailed investigation. And can we, can we just miss these timelines? No. Since it's confidential, I might not be able to talk, give examples on what has happened when people miss to report within the things, but it's pretty serious. We take it serious. This accident investigations, how we do accident investigation, why we do this accident investigation so seriously is we need to learn how, when, what could have been worse, what can you have done better, and in next step and next place where we can utilize this knowledge. We have a, something called SCAP, Systematic Post Analysis Tool, which we developed with the help of DNA a few years back. A unique investigation tool for Unilever. It's a very thorough level by level uh, tool which explain going to the details of root causes. We are talking about nearly almost all until in my career uh, and until uh, right now uh, I have been participating in uh, many investigations across the region. We were still not able to find anything which we couldn't match or couldn't do it with the SCAT tool. That's how it was, it is actually. And DNA has done a super job for in that space. So this, using this tool, we do the accident investigation and we go to the root cause analysis and actions are identified. This identified and implementation is one part for the particular thing and also we share the lessons learned from this uh, incident, every single incident, 
including including high potential emissors including high potential emissors high potential means which could have caused a death kind of accident near emissors so then we roll out we roll out this lessons across the globe if something happens in sri lanka we share this lessons learned with the actions and it goes across the globe and each and every factory each and every unit each and every office need to select relevant actions from for their particular function or uh, factory or the office and they need to do the review and they need to roll out to their premises or their operation we have one another step we have our internal lead for the site ranking it has different aspects safety is around the part of it and you need to be there we give marks or we give some points to this lead when you implement actions which is happened in some other country probably uh, how you in implement it in the and those actions need to be completed pretty rigorous and you might lose some marks if you have not done something happens 2000 kilometers away but still you need to implement action and if you not don't do it your league in your league you will be losing marks and that will be shown to all factory managers all directors across the globe no one likes it believe me i'm not going to talking about training but just to emphasize that training is so much your this thing is very important as well as we do the continuous communication and awareness to ensure that everything keeps in your mind all the time finally after we do all these things still there are bad boys then we need to take care of the mess after doing all these things after telling all these things after teaching all these things there might be people who are in the in the bell curve you know the last 10% of people there are still there are maybe people within the system this is something we have to to tackle that problem that's how we maintain our safety culture i hope i was able at least to give some kind of flavor how we practice safety and how we maintain safety culture in believers it's 80 years of journey bringing into 20 minutes pretty tough task but thank you very much for being patient with me hearing all this for last 20 minutes thank you very much thank you very much mr anushka kumar singh would like to call upon the occupational safety officer of nayosh mr charit silva on stage please to present mr anushka kumar singh with a special open of appreciation to the center please ladies and gentlemen please give it for mr anushka kumar singh With that note, we are ready to move on with the uh, next speaker, ladies and gentlemen. Currently, he is employed at Ansel Limited as the head of Global EHS and Risk Management. Bachelor's qualification in Engineering, specialized in 
Production Engineering and talk to you all on uh, what I am going to do in human error. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mr. Tanuja Samanai. The topic was introduced as what I am going to do with the human error. If you ask me, nothing. Because I cannot do anything with the human error because human error, we need to accept that people will make mistakes and people will do errors, right? So uh, having said that, uh, let me take, uh, what's it, one two minutes to introduce Ansel. Um, so Ansel is a, a global provider of safety solutions. We provide safety solutions. So since we are providing safety solutions, we are obliged to practice safety in our plants and in our locations. Um, having, you know, having 13 manufacturing locations in nine countries and another 52 hubs, uh, distribution centers, offices all over the world, it is not that easy to maintain a safety standard, which we do because we are passionate about it. Right? So, uh, as Anusha said, just starting with safety course, let me start with the safety course. So, this safety course is thanks to our decisions we made and our choices we made for what say last 40 years. Many of us had to either take either go to the office by foot or by bicycle or we had to stay in a petrol fuel for 10-15 uh, hours, right? So what this is about the, the duty of care that we need to take are those who are uh, privileged still to drive a car or a vehicle. When you are getting down from the vehicle, right, you have to think of the less privileged guys like me because I had to Ride, to, ride a bicycle to the office for about two weeks. Um, so let's privilege guys like me so that we are also going in the using the road. Unfortunately, for the, the same reasons of the bad choices and bad decisions that we have made previously, we don't have bicycle lanes here. So we have to use the same road. So when you are when you're opening your door, always use your hand inside the car or fathers to the uh, door so that you turn yourself to reach the latch so that automatically you see your blind spot so that you can save some bicycle riders some pedestrians or people may be traveling people may be walking or even the, the vehicles that you are that passing you right so this is called the touch bridge. So every one of us can practice this. Right. Okay. What I'm going to talk to you within the next 10-15 minutes may contradict many things that uh, you know, talked about earlier and maybe things that follow. Right. What is safety? Is it absence of accidents? Just raise your hands if you have a, a target or a, say, a tagline saying that zero incidents in your organization. If you do have, thank God. Um, because, you know, what we need to understand is people will make mistakes people that is that is what the people are so people will make the bad choices right that is how the people behave and can we be satisfied when you don't have incidents can we say that we are safe just because you don't have incidents what i believe is we can right and then Zero accidents is possibly can happen because the accident didn't happen, but still we will be pro accidents. Right? 
we can get the accidents and the once <coughs> if we if we believe that it's a zero incident concept once the accident happened it will be something that we never expected so it is we are taking just as a surprise as a um, act of or, or, uh, outcome of um, which we we did we did expect right so that can create a, a a sort of a situation where we are not ready for that right. instead if we build in a capacity to face the incident or accident safely which means we build in that we we do have a system where even the accident happen that accident happen safely so that injuries will be minimal or minor right so um, this is little bit controversial because that is not what we are uh, always think of we want zero accidents workplaces right we do want to prevent accidents and we we try to believe that all accidents are preventable right these are the the, the most common taglines we are using right so uh, basically I'm, i'm not that used to uh, this one way communication so if you if you, if you have anything just um, take it up so uh, why we are saying that um, safety is not um, why we need to build in this uh, the capacity to fail or the uh, having the incident or accident safely because we are all the managers here all the safety executives here we know that people have not only the safety goals but they have multiple other goals as well organizations are there to make profits organizations are there to deliver certain goods so there are multiple goals multiple targets coming in their way what people does is they do some trade offs while they are working we may have the the, the finest procedures we may have the finest resources we may have the finest or the, the, the meticulously done uh, working structures but it is us we are the people who are giving them the the goals for productivity goals for efficiency goals for quality as well as goals for safety right so we provide them with the environment that they will be given multiple goals and they will make choices so when you are doing the choices when you are getting the choices they take certain decisions we say that okay our priority is safety we can say that okay our business tackle like maybe we are not prioritizing anything but it's part of the business process that we do have safety built in that will be a nonsense for them because they do have certain priorities given 1 2 3 4 5. at any given day people will prioritize people will take certain choices they will do their trade offs and on that particular day they will decide oh, i am going to do this work in a different way it might prove safe because safety right is not a person if i switch off the switch and um, switch off the switch the bulb will go goes off and once it once i switch on it will come back safety is not like that right you can repeat i might do a act in a different way it may prove safe but i might do it again it might lead to an accident or the the what that lead to an accident may do it again may not cause the same accident so this is where we need to have that sense of uh, mindset or uh, we need to create a mindset as a safety professionals that people will do mistakes people will deviate from the the uh, sops that we have given so that we need to have the capacity to meet accident safely 
I'll take a small example. This is a story of a train driver. Right? He, he crashed the train from behind onto another train and injuring 28 people. Right? He missed the red light warning because because of that he missed the, the signal that given to slow down the train right? and he missed it because he was answering the phone right? and there is a company policy which banned using the mobile phones inside the cabin so he's a bad employee right Isn't it? He's a bad apple in the law. Right? Yeah. Very good. Because he used the mobile phone. Exactly. Right? So this is only one signal, right? He missed. During his journey, he may have obeyed 40, 50 odd signals. But with, with, with this one, he has become a bad person. He has, bad, he has become a bad operator. And a bad apple in the law. Okay. Just leave out the, 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 the phone. A spider in the cabin, when the train just reaching the red light, it falls on his lap. A spider in the cabin falls on his lap. So he want to take that spider out from his lap. So, the same distraction. He missed the signal light. He missed the signal for the uh, slowdown. 28 people injured. Is he a good person now? Is he a good operator? What is it? This is where we need to have capacity to meet accident safe. Right? Always blame is easy. But blame will not fix anything. Right? Another driver. Suppose he is answering the phone. For another engine driver, the, the spider thing happened. Again, he will kill maybe 28 people. Right? So do we have that capacity to, does this organization have the capacity to meet accident safely? No. That is what we need to build in organizations. Right? We started our safety journeys in early, now just forget about this 1960s, 80s, 80s, 2000, 2000 and onwards, any journey we start, any, any organization will start the journey with the, the technical improvement in safety. Right? We start improving the technical part. We do the machine guarding, we do uh, uh, interlocks, we do pedestrian markings, we do pedestrian uh, crossings and all these things. So technical things will be done. Right? And then later we realize that okay, having only these things is not enough. We need to have some set of procedures, right? Because we want people to behave the way we want, right? Isn't that what we want, what we're doing with the, the, the SOPs and the work instructions? We want people to behave the way we want, right? And we believe that whatever we say is the way to do that operation. Right? We first we put the technical things and then we put the SOP standards so that people will do that. Right? Is that important? Yes. It does reduce the incidents, accidents. Right? That is why the curve comes down. Right? Even after doing that, 
the organizations who have come up to that point will realize that still you are having incidents. Still you are facing with accidents. But however much you try to put the SOPs in, more rules, more compliance in, it doesn't help you. Why? Just because the more compliance, more rules you put in, in will give again, will will have that feeling in your mind that okay, this is the way that people are doing it. This is the way you do. That's imaginary way of doing things, and the really in the reality, what they do is different to that. So that gap exists. Always that gap exists. That's why you do the behavioral observations. Right? You do the behavioral observations in your class. You have a SOP, you have a work instruction, so people do things, you know, uh, deviating from that. So there's a gap. So you always observe this gap and try to fix it. Right? Fix it how? Get the people to do the way that you have stipulated it in the work instruction. Right? So we are behaving, try to behave the person who is doing that act based on our assumption that okay, this is the way that we want to do, this is the way that they are going to do. Right? And at the same time, the the failures become an un unpleasant surprise. Why is that? Because we see only the garnish of the salad. What has gone wrong? That is the only thing that we see. But the salad or that cake has been baking for years and years with so many different ingredients in it. We don't see it. I'll take that example. Operator fix a broken link of a conveyor. So this link, right, it is it is the one that drives the conveyor. Right? It's a simple fix that we need to do. He has seen it in what the uh, the maintenance how how they are doing it, right? He do the trade off. Right? If maintenance guys comes there, right, and try to fix it. It takes about 40 minutes because that guy need to come there and then fix the problem. You need to inform him. He need to come. He need to prepare it. So it need uh, 40 minutes to finish the stuff. But this person has seen it. It's been fixed within five minutes. Once he comes, right? Now the trade of mindset comes because we have given him the efficiency target. We have given him the delivery target. We have given him the the target for productivity. He fixes. When he fixes, the conveyor starts. His finger goes in. An accident happened. Right. What came up from the RCA is the uncertain, untrained activity and the maintenance taken time. Right? So here that, that conclusion is that person is not trained. Right? Now we have found not the first layer of blaming but the second layer of blaming. Who has not trained him? The supervisor, maybe the HR, maybe the his manager has not trained him. Or his supervisor has allowed him to work without Knowing that he is not trained, but he has allowed him to work. Again, the blaming. Now we, we, we think that okay, these things are okay. We are not blaming him, that person, but we take the next action. That training is not adequate. Training has not been done. Again, it's a blaming. We are not fixing anything. Right? Maintenance take time. Yeah, it's a good surface thing. Right? Again, we are blaming. So we are not fixing anything. Right? This is where the human organization performance will come into the picture. This is what we need to do again. Because we see 
only the last step. When it removed, you can you can remove many steps from this, right? Have you have you seen this? Hope, hope you have seen this, right? The stack gate, right? You can remove many pieces. It still it stands, but the, when when you remove the last possible uh, block, it collapses. Right? This is exactly what we are doing with our RCS and things like that. Unless otherwise, we think differently. We see only the last step we remove. And that is the missing thing, and that has caused the accident. But if you look at deeply, you have missed many, and it has been there with, without all those tags for years, right? So human error or human the the blaming part that we do to the human person, the person who is doing. Is a what is 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 basically he's he's not the instigator should be rather of an incident right or investigation he's inherited all these issues when he first stepped into work that is what we need to understand that is what we need to build in in organizations again the capability or the capacity to fail safe. Right, so that is through human organization performance. Now, who finds these root causes? Now, if you look at that stick, the sharp edge of the stick, who is nearest to the sharp edge of the stick? It is the worker. Right, who's in the blunt end? Is the executives, like you guys. Right, who is finding the solution? Who's finding the root cause? You. Who's not even near the the blood, the, 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 the sharp edge? Right? You go to the workplace only for one hour, maybe two hours. But that worker is working for eight hours. Since Dr. Pratipa Mahana Mahima is not here in some organizations, 12 hours in the same operation, right? So, bypassing him, we are giving him the solution by a person who is sitting far away from the sharp edge, right? And we send the decision back to them, okay, this is how you, how you guys need to work. Right? The next one, we need to understand blue line and the black line. The black line is how we say people do things. The working structures, SOPs. And what the blue line says is how people do around that. They do better, they take risk. Depending on the day, depending on the time, depending on the, uh, the priorities that that person has on any given day. Right? And when the incident happens, is when the red line meets the blue line. And it's not always happening as well. It can start. Right? Again, what we need to do? Yes, we need to find the root causes. We need to fix the past. Right? This is something that I would like you guys to go there and practice. Right? You find the root cause. You make the problem statement, right? And read that problem statement to a bunch of people who are doing that job and associated with that job and make them a learning team. Give them the problem, right? Now you have fixed the past, you have fixed what happened. Now what you need to do is ensure that that blue line is very much closer to the black line. Who can do, do that? We can't do it. People need to find solutions. Because they know why they are bypassing that. They have all the reasons to bypass it. All the reasons to take the deviations. Right? What we are doing? 
trying to behave them and then put them into the black line. Who, who, who take that decision? It's we take that decision. It won't help. It won't effective. Right? Get them, get them to form a group and make it a, a sort of a, a learning team and take out how we can build the capacity in the organization. Because these people are working with certain constraints, certain um, contradictory goals right, all the time, and they make choices based on those decisions and trade-offs they do. And they know how to surface them, and they know how to overcome them as well. And my last thing is change the way you think. Whenever we, we do the investigations, we always ask who did that? Right? And why did that? We always talk about the five eyes and then who part comes naturally. Right? Rather than that, ask what? Always ask. Just think, you know, when you ask why that happened, it, it comes to me like it's becoming so personal. Right? Just ask what has happened? They will say because it's outside. Whenever you say that what has happened, it, it gives that, you know, with the with the with the tone, with the voice, with everything, it, it shows that it is something outside. Right? So they will come up with so many things. What has happened? Right? And it's always human error. Human error is not the cause of the problem. Human error is only the symptoms of issues that has been there for a long period. Right? So human error is only a symptom. Don't take the human error as a right? So if we can set our mind to not to blame people, not to find them and not to take them to HR, right? You will learn many things. And you can you can increase your capacity to fail. Increase your capacity to fail safe. Right? And human error is not random. It's it's we, we think it's it's random and unreliable because people can do it and then it's it can happen. So it's random. But it is not random, it is very systematic. Why people, the human error is systematic, is because they have been doing, they have been dealing with so many deviations, so many things that we have provided them, and they have covered up all the issues that we have created for them for a long period. Right? So it is, again, it is not an acceptable conclusion in a investigation as a course, but it is a, a, a point to further investigate because the moment you find a human error is surfaced, there should be many things lying inside. So the conclusion of today's my presentation is five principles, error is normal. That is why we call we are living beings, we are humans. We do mistakes, we do error. Right? Keep it in mind, blame fix nothing. It doesn't fix anything. You just blame a person, take the bad apple out and then another apple will come and become bad. Because the problem is still there. Right? So it doesn't fix anything, so don't blame. So learning is very important and learning through the, the investigations as well as through the learning teams. So you learn the past, learn the future. You make your system more robust. Right? So that you have the capacity to fail safe. And then the context drives behavior. So focus on the context that drives the behavior, not the behavior. We all do this mistake. We try to correct the behavior. You can't correct the behavior as long as the context is there. You correct this behavior, but since the context is there, they will take another behavioral step, deviation, 
to overcome that context. So always try to find what context drives that behavior and correct that. Right? That will eliminate that problem. And finally, how we respond to matters. That is asking the right question. So don't ask the questions that personally make people feel like they are blamed, but ask the question in a different way. What went wrong? Rather, who did that or why it went wrong? Thank you. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, we are ready to present to Mr. Tanuja Samaranayaka also with a very special token of appreciation. Mr. Samaranayaka, if you can come to the center of the stage, please. Can we have Mr. Lal Samarasekhar, additional secretary, Ministry of Labor and Foreign Relations on stage, please, presenting our speaker, Mr. Tanuja Samaranayaka, with a special token of appreciation. before we open the forum for the panel discussion. Ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, we'd like to call upon the Managing Director of Hades and Bondies Limited. Please welcome Mr. Ruan Moigrathner to talk about safe leadership from word to action. Director General Marsh, Dr. Mrs. Amra Singh, distinguished invitees, ladies and gentlemen. I'm delighted to be here today to make a small presentation on the Nairosh Conference 2022. I see uh, a room full of uh, experts here today, and I listen to some fantastic presentations, but I must confess that I'm no expert on the subject. So I speak with absolute humility, um, and I would like to reflect uh, a bit on uh, organizations and leadership uh, because I'm in no way uh, capable of making a technical presentation. So, moving on to my presentation, I must say that uh, from the times we joined organizations, then health and safety was something that was never spoken of. But today, it is top on our agenda. It is not only about health and safety for organization sustainability. People do demand for the right environment to be created by the organizations. Your customers do demand the right practices. And we run a huge risk of losing businesses and businesses failing unless we give OHS the due recognition and the due priority. So I can start with a, an experience that we had. Hades Advantage that I represent is a logistics company. Uh, having done extremely well in Sri Lanka, we moved, decided to move to Myanmar. 
when we want to handle the logistics of uh, multinational. And we were preparing ourselves to take over the business of a large logistics provider. And we leased this large facility and we were renovating it to meet the customer's expectations. So we subcontracted the renovation job to a party who had multiple subcontractors working for them. And very unfortunately, working at height, this, the, the party that we had subcontracted, we had subcontracted it again. And uh, this person who was working on scaffolding fell and there was a fatality. Now, the first thing that happened was the multinational, I don't want to mention names because of confidentiality reasons. The first thing that the multinational did was to freeze our contract. They said, you are not going to get the contract. Until and unless we are satisfied that your processes are in place, your safety processes are in place. And they went through a thorough audit to satisfy themselves that we had the processes and the procedures in place. And having satisfied themselves, only that they gave us permission to go ahead. Had we not satisfied them in the processes we follow, that would have been a lost business. So that's the level of risk that we run, unless and until we have our act right as far as which is, is concerned. So if we move on to the uh, 17 sustainability goals of the UN, this is a much talked of thing. I'm not going to go into detail. You, you all know what this is about uh, and how much responsible organizations are driving these 17 initiatives. OHS comes under the eighth goal where they talk about decent work and economic growth. That's where OHS comes in. And if we talk about how serious this is to set the context, we have been talking about 340 million occupational accidents a year accounting for 4% of global GDP loss due to work accidents and diseases, which translates to about $3 trillion. Just imagine the impact. This accounts for 2. Point, I think the minister also gave this number, uh, 2.7 8 million deaths due to work-related accidents and diseases every year, which translates to 6,500 deaths a day. So when you look at these numbers, it's by no means a small affair. These numbers calls for much attention, and I think we have, it's not a choice, but an imperative for organizations to work on proper health and safety standards in organizations. Now, for any health and safety initiative to work in an organization, the first thing that has to happen is that it needs to be aligned with your business strategy. You can't have health and safety and business running falls apart. So you need to align the health and safety initiatives with the business. Now, how do you do this? 
we have organizations running driven by visions and missions. We have these visions and missions hanging on walls, driving our businesses. And more recently, we have seen purposes driving businesses. We talk of purpose-driven organizations, giving a human touch to the business. So as far as Admartis is concerned, how will we be able to align health and safety to our business is through our purpose and our culture. Advantages purpose is inspire, connect, enrich. Now if you take the word enrich, it's about people's well-being. And when you look at our culture, which stands on some several values, one is about caring for people. So we talk about advantage, caring for one another. So this purpose, enriching the lives of people and society, and the value of caring brings in the element of safety, health and safety. So that's how we have been able to interconnect OHS, in, OHS into the business and to drive uh, forward the initiative of OHS. So, if you really look at leadership, if you look at this slide, the leaders only hear a four percent of the problems that actually happen in an organization, and ninety plus ninety-six percent is unseen. Can you imagine that ninety-six percent of the problems that are faced? by organizations is unseen by the leadership. Now this is through a study, an interesting study done. So then we come with the question of how do we address the 96% as a leader? How do you reach out to that 96%? How do you get that visibility for that 96%? So that's when actually the leadership role plays in. You need to make sure that occupation, now health and safety is not somebody's job, but your job. It's a top-down initiative and it has to be driven through absolute passion by the leader. So there's no question about it. Unless it is driven with passion and feeling by the leadership, you will fail. So that's the most important thing, to engage yourself and to be very much a part of the various initiatives that you, you carry out. As far as uh, advantage goes, uh, these things have uh, spoken out before, starting new, but we, our leadership team, on a regular basis, carries out something called a safety walk. We allocate a day where we go to one of our sites, walk through the site, talking to the shop floor people, understanding what they do, and identifying the non-compliant areas, the risky areas, and we complete the session by carrying out a detailed debriefing of what was found. We carry out things like toolbox talks, safety briefings before pro projects are carried out, 
there was safety pauses that we we you know we the um, speaker spoke about. We have something called the safety moment, where at every meeting we start with the safety moment where one talks about uh, an incident, uh, just to keep reminding people because at the end of the day it's a behavior. It's not something that you can force, like it was said. It is something that you need to practice and you need to spread it around for people to pick up that behavior and run. So you need to create that visibility that you as a leader is very much involved and passionate in driving the old OHS initiative through the organization. There is a responsibility on the practitioners at this point, where the practitioners should address this 96% that the leadership doesn't see by creating the right platform. And that is the way that we need to make sure that we get that real visibility to see through that 96% is that is generally not seen. I'll give you an example. Uh, this is something that happened to myself. I was at our distribution center in Calamere and I was walking out after a meeting. When I got a call from my chairman, I took my phone, I answered the phone and I was walking down the steps with a young executive was responsible for was learning uh, uh, safety at the time. He stopped me. He said, "Sir, please don't move. Take your call first." And he showed me that I had violated the policy because there were. Sticker on saying you're not supposed to answer the code and go down the steps. The interesting thing here is that this young man had the authority and the power to stop me and tell me either to stop the call or stand there and finish your call. And when I came to Colombo, I had a message on my computer saying that I had violated this and calling for explanation. Right? So I had to give my explanation, my part of the explanation and apologize for that. And I did commend him on that. And today I'm proud to say that that young man then today is heading up OHS in Myanmar and in Thailand. So that's the kind of empowerment, the authority that you need to give the practitioners. Um, Advantis is driven by a OHS management system that is based on the national OHS management system. This is something that uh, is commonly used and depending on your business, the sensitivities, the size and scale of business, uh, you could pick and choose what elements of it to give priority to. Uh, but as far as we are concerned, we drive our organization uh, with much emphasis or much weightage on management commit commitment and line accountability. And skills, competencies, and communication. So this is uh, a very um, uh, common management system that we use, uh, but it will vary from industry to industry depending on the respective sensitivities. So basically, if we talk of leadership, driving OHS, in a nutshell, you need to look at a few things. As I said, 
The most important thing is to align your OHS strategy with the business strategy. So that can come with a strong purpose which inculcates your business purpose and the OHS strategy. And a culture to drive this behavior because as I said, it's a top-down approach uh, and, a, and, a, and a behavior that needs to be spread right across the organization. And to do that, you need to have a structure and people to support the structure. In organizations where there are multiple businesses, you have to have a very strong structure to support it and direction right from the top. People with the right competencies and capabilities and skills to drive this initiative across and these people should be fully empowered. A proper management system to make sure that your policies, procedures and processes are in place to hold the whole thing together and as I said the leadership commitment and a proper governance process. We practice a govern governance process where we have our business KPIs that drive our business and a few OHS KPIs which connects to even remuneration. So these KPIs trickle down to the individuals from the organization level, from the very top, it trickles down to departments, to people, individuals. And this framework links the KPIs to their remuneration system. So by linking uh, the remuneration system to, uh, to these KPIs, we've been able to drive this initiative much more effectively uh, than before. And I think uh, the most important thing in this whole initiative is to have this whole framework of purpose, organization structure, the right people, right leadership, and the OHS uh, system that runs and the governance process. So this is what I wanted to bring as uh, uh, a different dimension to uh, what the real practitioners uh, spoke of, the technical stuff, uh, how important Leadership is to drive uh, OHS in an organization. So ladies and gentlemen, uh, I'm honored to be here today uh, with an uh, audience of eminent people, uh, uh, top practitioners of OHS, um, and I hope that I was able to bring the dimension of the organization and the leadership uh, a little bit of that flavor to the whole uh, uh, whole audience, and I hope that you will have a good uh, session going forward. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Ruan Bhaktiratna, and the director of the Advantage Limited for that very thorough and impressive representation. We let all on that agenda of Nayosh, Dr. Trumpinawa Singha, to present Dr. In fact, Mr. Ruan Bhai Ratna with a special token of appreciation.
thank you for Mr. Ron Boyka. Thank you very much. So with that note, we are ready for the panel discussion and we'd like to call upon the panelists to take your respective seats. First, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we have Professor Bajura Alibola, who has been with the uh, Federation since 2000 and has experience in representing the member organizations before various uh, fora such as Labor Tribunals, Labor Department, and Arbitrations, Industrial Court. In addition, his expertise includes workplace dispute resolution, negotiating collective bargaining agreements with trade unions, and advising and training on labor, employment law, and industrial employees' relations, and also represents the interest of the employers at the uh, Tribunal Fora, such as the National Labor Advisory Council and the various boards. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Professor Vajra Alibola. Next we have Engineer Gayan Fernando, Lead Technical Consultant to National Occupational Safety and Health Excellence Awards and a member of the uh, National OSH Technical Advisory Committee in Sri Lanka and also the board member of the uh, NIOSH Currently working as general manager of OSH and LZ1 is limited. Ladies and gentlemen, Engineer Gan Fernando. We also have Engineer Chandani Kandavadan, experienced safety consultant trainer, doctor, doctoral candidate with a demonstrated history of working in the professional training and coaching in the industry, skilled in negotiations, emergency management, quality management, quality assurance and occupational health. There is a German engineer, Chandri And taking us through uh, the panel discussion, we have the Director General of NIOSH, Dr. Chandri Kamala who is from the uh, State Medical University of Law and USSR Master of Medicine in Occupational Medicine. National University of Singapore, Master of Science in Community Medicine, Postgraduate Institute of Medicine, University of Columbus, Sri Lanka, and the Postgraduate Diploma in OSH, IENO Collaborative Center, University of Turin, Italy, and the Doctor of Medicine in Community Medicine, Postgraduate Institute of Medicine, University of Columbus, Sri Lanka. There is a gentleman, Dr. Chandrika Amar Singh, to take us through the discussion. Right, uh, we all know that uh, there is an international school 
international tool on occupational safety and health, which is the ISO 45001. So what NASH does always is we want to go for innovations and we want to develop some kind of uh, tangible tools which can be practiced by the industry easily and a user-friendly manner. So what we did was, uh, we, like, uh, when it comes, when the ISO 45001 comes, we went through it and we found that it is a bit of complex. It's a kind of a system where you have to put lots of effort and it uh, costs is once again another like barrier maybe to the industry. And there are lots of challenges which the industry can face when they want to go for the uh, certification. Uh, because some of the industries, they didn't have much of mature safety cultures. And uh, they have, like, they think safety is something like checking the personal protective equipment or doing a kind of a toolbox stuff. So that is the way that certain industries behave. So what we, thought, what we saw was, when they want to go for certification, it, it, it was very, very difficult and it is still, uh, they have to uh, struggle a lot. So because of that, we thought we need a kind of a, uh, a tangible, a user-friendly, uh, easy uh, method to develop the systems before you reach 45001. So that was the initiative we all, uh, like uh, we thought that we have to take and we thought of developing a very user-friendly, simple tool which can any industry can implement. Uh, so it is going to be, I think it is a very initial uh, industry. Like the, if the country is not that developed, they also can go for this kind of simple tool before they reach the S41. So that's that is why we thought of developing this kind of tool. Yes, indeed. I think we have found the answers to that. And my next question goes to Brian Fernando. With the implication of this tool, what kind of benefits a particular company day or an industry as a whole, how will they be benefit with this tool implication? Yes, uh, when you consider about the, uh, the benefit of the uh, structured safety approach, actually it covers the entire 360 degree of uh, the requirement of the organization. Because when you consider about the national OHS management system, uh, the, the recently my managing director put this slide with the eight different modules. That is the, uh, the basic structure of the national OHS management system. As an organization, we are also adapting uh, national OHS management system as a management system practicing that advice. So that, when you recall your memory uh, with that eight modules, you can see uh, starting from management commitment and life accountability, emergency preparedness and reporting, health, wellness and health uh, and well-being, then uh, design and process safety. So likewise, there are several elements, it's a altogether eight elements. That means, that covers the, all the basic requirement of safety management system. Before going, even if someone over, some organization need to go for ISO 45001 certification. Yes, what I feel is that's a really good start point. Instead of just doing something to obtain a certificate and hang on the board, there is a proper process to create the culture by using this level of uh, simple and effective tool like notion -based. So when we are implementing that type of thing, we can do our self-evaluation, that's another benefit. At the same time, we can consult easily the NIOSH and get the benefit from, uh, from the external views as well. At the same time, we can go for a stepwise implementation. This is a one simple example. Here, what we can see is, this is the, uh, the, the, the implementation recognition methodology developed by the NIOSH. This goes with the, the star voting. This is actually the five star rating, so same way, when some uh, uh, NIOSH conducting the evaluation of your notion list, they will rank the organization for different level. Maybe starting from first star to five star, different level, and based on that one, you can map your development plan, the proper uh, action plan to reach in a certain timeline, go up to the five level star rating. 
So once you are reaching the high level star rating, you need to worry about the consulting, external uh, consulting who are getting the ISO and all because you are already equipped and at the same time you have a very strong team with you with a proper understanding about all the safety and health requirement to obtain a certificate. I think that's a very satisfactory answer why we should implement it and why this tool is necessary for all of us and a good way to start. And yet another problem I would like to ask from engineering Shandini Kandal. Can you briefly explain me about the OSGS consultants and how you can carry this out in NIOSH perspective, the process, the implementation and how uh, it will be carried out? Okay, uh, so let me start like this. For uh, you all, as industries, uh, you need to start the process by uh, applying to NIOSH and the application process. So you need to introduce your organization and uh, like what are your processes as simple application form. Then uh, NIOSH would uh, give you a proposal with all the documentation, your documentation and uh, management report. Then uh, after you go through, if you need any trainings related to this uh, management system, I was just happy to do the training for your organizations. Then uh, after you implement it, right, I can support you the implementation as well. Then there will be the auditing process similar to uh, the National Safety uh, Award system. There will be independent auditors and there is audit protocol also in that. So uh, these independent auditors will visit your site and do the comprehensive uh, auditing process and they are onwards uh, based on your implementation uh, scores, based on the audit scores, you will be given a kind of a report with whatever the gaps uh, that you already have and uh, a kind of a uh, scoring as the uh, is saying it will be a uh, Starting from 50% level, you are getting uh, one star, then 60% two star. Likewise, when you reach the 90% of the scores, you are uh, getting the maximum gold star. So, likewise, uh, so at the end of the uh, auditing process, you are eligible. If you are eligible for the star rating, that is, you pass the 50% mark, uh, you will be getting the star rating as a plus. At the same time, a comprehensive report will be there so that you know what are your gaps and what are your next steps to reach the next level. Okay? So each uh, score will be valid for two years. Then if you are willing to write upgrade your scores before that, even before that, if you are uh, confident that you can reach another star, then you can reapply and go to the next uh, application level. I think you have answered the question very well. And now, before ending this session, it's time for the audience to ask questions uh, from our panel about any questions you have about the system. It's your time. Like uh, in the management system, there's not only training, 
But there are other requirements also like uh, interiority and even the environmental monitoring and the fitness to work assessments and so on and forth. Uh, so you can get NAP support for that and uh, we are there to provide you the services. So it's a matter of requesting whatever the services you want. So accordingly we can uh, support you all. Do you have, uh, do you do uh, airline industry audits as well? This uh, airline industry is uh, particular with the uh, normal industry, this occupation and health and safety. Do you do those type of assessment also? Uh, to add to that, uh, uh, yes, uh, because this management system developed as a universal tool to apply for any industry, but in sector-wise or industry-wise, there are several specific areas we need to address. Definitely during the assessment process, that will touch based on the industry record. But uh, there are certain other areas like uh, maybe the external certification requirement that every industry need to maintain. That's beyond this scope of uh, our list. But uh, generally, common-wise, I think uh, that will cover by the ground uh, level of uh, Basically, the principles are the same, so we can uh, we can do. But there are specific ones for the uh, airline sector, so I think. Uh, yeah, in the, in the for the airline sector, there are regulators, like our International Civilization Organization, and local regulators as well, Civilization of the Resort Sri Lanka. They are doing their safety management system, not as a occupational health and safety management. It is as a safety management system. So when you are doing occupational point of view, so there should be a different, I think, uh, checklist to find the gap. So while flying, while having uh, operation like that, other than the uh, industrial aspects of the engineering and all operations. So do you do those titles, then we can yeah, take about it. Yes, when it comes to occupational safety and health, in auditing, the principles are the same. So we apply the auditing principles for occupational safety and health. So yes, we can do that. So I would like to ask, uh, what are the benefits we can get from that tool to a small scale of industry, which does not have proper uh, OSH culture? Yes, uh, actually. Uh, once you receive the tool, you will understand that it has simple uh, requirements, set of requirements under eight clusters. So uh, as a basic, as a small scale industry, uh, you can start with the risk assessment, that's the basic requirement, and it's the first step of the risk management tool as well. So uh, even in the office, uh, general office, you can apply this, uh, this concept because management system is for everyone, even for a shop, even for a market, anything, any organization can apply this. And uh, it is kind of a small scale and if you don't have that kind of a good safety culture, I think it's the opportunity for you to start with. Because uh, when you compare the other management system, the cost is also very less. So, and the way of starting again, it is simple. So it is in, uh, very uh, beneficial for them. Small scale industry to start something with this. And as we said previously, I think uh, in small scale industries we see the leadership commitment. Uh, so, like you can learn lots of things even from the conference. We were talking about the leadership commitment uh, and how to uh, go with uh, human errors and so on. So, I think uh, those are the things that you can apply uh, while you are applying for in the commercial base. Uh, would like to understand like uh, what sort of international recognition that you are so like international level marketing or introduction you are planning to do with regard, regard to this uh, tool and certification piece. I'm representing the apparel sector, so we do work with a lot of brands. And uh, so, what would be the additional benefit apart from the safety uh, assurance we can get through this uh, tool and certification? What would be the additional benefits that we can uh, get from brands from a recognition point of view? Actually, we want to drive this towards the Occupational Safety and Health Excellence Awards. So uh, that will be the final of it. So you will have 
opportunities and you will uh, slowly drive towards that. So that of course uh, like uh, give you uh, the benefits of attracting your customers and uh, that. So, but anyway, we thought that this is going to be a kind of a stepwise approach uh, and uh, you will identify your gaps and when the international auditors comes to your place, uh, before they come, you can do your corrections on your own as well. Uh, at the same time, if some of you can recall your memory of last uh, special safety awards. During that awards, uh, the gear, chief guest, uh, yes. prime minister, actually that time, Rani Vikram Singh, uh, very clearly mentioned about how we can capitalize the, the proper health and safety culture for different markets. So that's a very strong statement, but we uh, heard from him during, as a Prime Minister at that time. So now he's a President, I think definitely we can find the different routes to utilize the uh, standard of competitive and safety for different markets. Good afternoon. We are from Surah.com. We are the market trade for training in Ayos in South Asia. Uh, you probably say that we recently joined with uh, NIA, NIOS to deliver two day uh, health and safety program for our students. But I thought of, as a you know, service organization, I thought of applying and, uh, this OSH, uh, you know, the practices for our organization. What are the uh, you know, things we can uh, implement at initial to get the OSH uh, practices? Yes, basically in the management system we start with the safety and health policy. So development of a policy on occupational safety and health, uh, which always we are like focusing into align with as 45,000 requirements. So that will be and then uh, you forward with like assessment and uh, you can go forward with uh, like uh, risk assessment finds you the gaps and then you can develop your gaps accordingly and then it should be uh, simply you can start with that. Thank you. Yes, if there's no more question, uh, we can end the question session from the audience. And I would like to thank our panel here today uh, who answers all the frequent questions and I think we've got a comprehensive idea about how we can apply to this and why we should go for this. Uh, let's give a round of applause to our viewers and panelists here today for the wonderful panelists. Thank you. 